For those of you who don't know me, my name is Erica Reddick. I am, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, many of you know me as the host of Generally Irritable, a podcast that covers politics here in Vermont, news here in Vermont. Uh, actually, one of my accounting clients is here, so that's kind of cool. Uh, some of you know me from, from various different endeavors that I've been engaged in. But what you may not know is, is why I was invited and asked to host the event. So I happen to be uniquely qualified to, uh, to talk and to help host this event because I've been on both sides of the criminal justice scenario. I've been vo both the victim and the perpetrator. I am, in fact, the statistic that we hear about very often here in Vermont. In 2001, I was out downtown with some friends of mine and I was drugged and sexually assaulted. I woke up the next day to a stranger in my bed and then went through the process of, of reporting that person to the police, going through all of, all of the, the motions of that and ended up having my case dismissed for lack of sufficient evidence. So going through that, my doctor saw that I was struggling with stress and anxiety. Shocker, right? When, when you're drugged and, or when you're victimized in such a way as your power is really just taken completely away from you and you realize that you can't always protect yourself and that there are people out there who are willing to do you harm even when you're paying attention. So my doctor said, oh, Erica's got anxiety. We'll just prescribe her a little medication to help with that. Well, it wasn't long before that prescription drug got mixed with alcohol, got mixed with some other things, because as you can imagine, going through that kind of traumatic event had a tremendous impact on me. And so I went from being a very strong-willed, very strong-minded young woman to a drug addict and an alcoholic. And in 2005, after many years of being miserable and unhappy and struggling with drug addiction, I was arrested and I served time in the Windsor State Facility for women because I stole money from my employer to support my drug habit. And I thank God every single day that I got caught and I got busted when I did and I got arrested and I had the police intervene in my addiction. Amen, that is correct. Because if I hadn't, I don't know that I would still be alive today. I don't know that I would still be alive today if the criminal justice system gave me what it calls mercy today. Had I not been made accountable for my actions, had I not been told that I was responsible even though I was also a victim, I would never have regained agency over my life standing before you today with 13 years of sobriety. And so, thank you. So uh, in 2009, I surrendered my life to the God that I understood at that time. I took uh, 12 steps. I started to put my life back together. I learned how to be a contributing member of society again. I learned that it didn't matter how far down the path I had gone, I could overcome and have all of my hopes and dreams. I counted on and I utilized the justice system to help me put my life back together and get back on my feet. When I struggled, I called my corrections officer, I called my probation officer, I asked for help. I utilized the system to get well. And I believe that other people can do the same thing. The reason I am so passionate about this, we have among the highest drug abuse in the country. And now with the rising crime, violent crime here in Vermont, and we're saying, oh, well, if you're, if you're an addict or if you're this, we're just going to leave you on the street. And we're not going to do anything about it. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not mercy. That is not how we have a safe and civil society. And so I am super excited to have been asked to host this event uh, and, and to introduce our guests because 
If it wasn't for the work that you all have done, I know that I wouldn't be standing here today and I can't tell you how many more of my compatriots in, in the sober community also would not be here today. So thank you for your efforts and thank you for being here. You can clap for that. <laughs> I remember we've, we've got some security in the back room. I remember telling the police officer, thank you for arresting me one time. And he was like, I've never had anyone thank me for arresting them. And I said, well, if you didn't, I'd be dead. So there you go. So this evening, we're really excited to be joined. First, let me introduce our moderator, Christopher Aaron Felker. He is the, he is the Burlington GOP chair and, uh, and, and political extraordinaire. He's just, he's helping everybody with their campaigns and he's working super hard. So it's super good. Michael Hall, executive director of the Vermont Police Coalition, down on the end. Christina Nolan, former U.S. Attorney for the District of Vermont. And Brady, I always pronounce your name wrong. Brady, it's Townsing, right? That works? Correct me. Tunzing. Brady Tunzing. Ah! Former Senior Counsel for the United States Department of Justice. Thank you. And uh, Christopher is going to take it from here. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Christopher Aaron Felker, and I'll be moderating this event this evening. I'm going to introduce our, our guest. Michael Hall has 40 years of law enforcement experience. He was the Manchester, Vermont Police Department for 36 years and retired as chief in 2019. He has served on his local school board as chairman, and he has operated, he has operated a successful contracting business for 35 years. He is been the executive director of the Vermont Police Coalition since its creation in 2012, and he is also certified as a licensed polygraph examiner. Mr. Brady Tunsing is a Vermont lawyer and partner in the Washington, D.C. law firm Genova, D. Genova and Tunsing. He previously served as the legislative assistant to the United States Senator Warren Rudman. More recently, he worked with the United States Department of Justice as senior counsel in the Office of Legal Policy. In private practice, he has successfully defended government officials, including the director of Washington, D.C.'s prison system and the FBI hostage rescue team member during the investigations into Ruby Ridge and Waco. Ms. Christina Nolan has served as the U.S. Attorney for Vermont from 2017 to 2021. In that capacity, she focused her efforts on tackling the opioid crisis and gun violence by increasing the number of federal charges against drug trafficking organizations, domestic abusers, and convicting Purdue Pharma for illegally marketing oxycodone and partnering with treatment and prevention communities. Ms. No <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> Ms. Nolan is also known for charging the EB-5 scandal in the Northeast Kingdom, the Kingdom Con, the largest fraud case in the history of Vermont, and for securing one of the most significant human trafficking convictions in the history of the country. Her work also focused on promoting the Northern Birther security and combating child exploitation, among other safety issues. Before serving as U.S. Attorney, Ms. Nolan worked as the, US, as the Assistant U.S. Attorney at the U.S. Attorney Office in 2010 to 2017, prosecuting a wide range of federal charges. She is presently a litigation partner at the Burlington Law Firm of Sheehy Furlong and BM. Beam. Beam. And again, my name is Chris Dreyer and Felker, and I'll be the moderator of this evening's event. Uh, the format is going to be as follows. We, this is a panel discussion and public workshop. We will be addressing four different topics. The first topic will be each panelist will be address, will address their assigned subject matter for about five to 10 minutes. Uh, I will offer some follow-up questions afterwards and we'll repeat this process with each one of the panelists. The fourth panel on how law and for order is being restored in other states will be addressed by the entire panel. Once we get through the fourth panel, we will open up the floor for, conversa for questions. Are we set with the PowerPoint? Okay. Okay. 
Terrific. So the topics for this evening will begin with Mr. Michael Hall taking a closer look at crime statistics. Uh, Mr. Tunsing will take us into examining qualified immunity and Ms. Nolan will, her panel is providing law enforcement and prosecutors with appropriate tools through legislative action. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Michael Hall. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher, and thank you, uh, Keith Vermont Safe, for inviting me here this evening to be part of this discussion. Uh, <clears throat> if the statistics that you're about to see tonight uh, alarm and concern you, they should. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is to start out by kind of defining what some of those statistics are and how they're derived. And for example, uh, Burlington defines uh, gunfire incident as an incident where they believe that a firearm has been discharged in some sort of a commission or direction of a criminal act. And uh, so the numbers that you see here aren't uh, firework. They're gunshot, and they're uh, defined as such. A shooting is an incident where an individual has actually been shot or injured. And to help you understand those, I think it's important that you know that be clarified so you understand the statistics that you're looking at aren't you know just random calls of you know gunfire, uh, fireworks, or something of that nature. And uh, the statistics in themselves, again, should be concerning to anyone in the city here uh, because from 2012 to 2019, your city was experiencing a couple of these incidents per year. Um, sometimes more, sometimes a little less, but the average was two. Uh, about 2020, those numbers jumped up to uh, 12 a year. And then in 2021, they went to 14. And so far in 2022, we're at 23. Those numbers in and of themselves speak and indicate that you got a problem. And the gunfire incidents are broken down here in the chart that you see on the display. And um, they're broken down by uh, day of the week. And um, just give me a moment to put my glasses on. I'm a little nearsighted. Um, and by the time of day. And if you look at those statistics, there's nothing out of the ordinary on those. Uh, most of the shootings, most police activity of significant uh, volume happens uh, over the weekends and during the evening hours, early morning. And uh, that's reflected by the statistics that you can see here. And, uh, you know, obviously Saturday night, early Sunday morning is a critical time. And that seems to be when you have most of your problems. And uh, those time frames are pretty consistent with a number of different crimes that take place during those days and hours. And um, if we could go to the next slide of by calendar year, or excuse me, by calendar days. Uh, if you look at the statistics on there, it's pretty much like a dartboard. I don't think there's any way that you could foresee or do any kind of proactive estimating or policing where you think you may be able to select the date and time that one of these incidents might happen, which shows the randomness of what it is. And from a policing standpoint, it's hard to allocate resources when you have those kind of uh, metrics in the incidents when they take place, because you could staff, change your staffing ratios and staffing hours, and as you could see, it would be nearly impossible to uh, figure out when would be the appropriate time and place to have the majority of your staff working. And 
we move on to um, crime rates overall, and I think that uh, would be an opportunity to take a look at whenever you have an increase in, in gun violence and whenever you have a significant increase in crime period, it's important to take a look at averages over the years. And comparing, again, your five-year year to date, so all of the numbers that you see in any of the charts are year to date of the time those statistics were put together, you'll see that in every category but two up there on the board, 2022 figures have increased significantly. And most importantly, if you look at the incidence of quality of life issues, such as stolen vehicle, gunfire up 340%, your drug overdoses are up 146%, um, aggravated assaults 52%. Those kind of numbers, when you see them from one year to another, are just astronomical. If this was a five-year average, you would think it wasn't such a big deal, but these numbers are condensed. And those numbers that you see there may not totally be accurate because you don't really know how many crimes weren't reported. You don't know how many people were sexually assaulted that didn't report it. You don't know how many people had their vehicle stolen only to have their neighbor, friend, or somebody tell them where it was and they went and they got it or what have you. So anytime you see statistical numbers like that, you can probably expect that those numbers are a little bit greater in some respects. Um, what's interesting when I was looking at the information and I, I heard some comments from some of the folks uh, within your community that, well, the, the crime rates aren't that far off from what they were, you know, say back in uh, 2017 or whatever. When you're looking at things like burglary, uh, what, what's happening is, and I saw this in our community, is that a lot of times you get people that don't report crimes. And the reason why they don't report them is for the same reason a lot of people, they've lost faith in the system. And in some cases, they'll say, well, what good is it going to do? They're not going to do anything anyway. And so, again, those, those numbers could be skewed. Also, you know, when you're talking about reported burglaries, one or two people in a community can cause those numbers to, to go all over the place. I mean, one individual can commit a tremendous amount of burglaries in a period of, you know, one night. And provided that they don't get caught over, say, a summer's period of time or a three-month span, they could, they could create havoc within your community. And I think if you haven't experienced that here, there are certainly communities in Vermont that have. Uh, the one thing that I would like to see out of that survey and, and statistical information is how, much of those, how many of those crimes were committed by the same person? How many of those crimes that you see up there are the same individual, maybe multiple charges, maybe multiple crimes, but they're still out committing more crimes in your community? And um, one of the things that I think is important and... Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm in uncharted territory here in Burlington, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it because I've said it for a long time, even back when I was chief. You, 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 if you have an area or you have a city or a jurisdiction where crime is not being, or the laws are not being enforced, we go back to the broken window theory that if you don't take care of little incidents, they become big incidents. And, you know, when you have a, a county prosecutor that is not prosecuting certain cases or dismissing certain cases or dismissing charges, that feeds into the frenzy of the criminal element. 
because it doesn't take these folks long to realize that they're not going to be or be any consequences or very minor consequences. And again, I would go back to the fact that there comes a point where the crime becomes so much of a normal thing every day, they're exposed to it. There are areas of the cities around the country where people don't report the crimes because they are pretty well convinced nothing's going to happen. And I suspect that that is already happening here. And with that, you know, I think that uh, the information that the public has, my gauge on how safe your communities are shouldn't be based on numbers. They should be based on what the public feels because you folks are going to realize when you have a problem to the scale that needs to be addressed long before the numbers indicate that. And I think you're well beyond that point. And, you know, it's not going to change overnight, but there are a lot of factors driving, in my opinion, a lot of factors driving why you're, why you're seeing the increases in crime in your city that you are. And on a statewide basis, I think if you look on a statewide and on a national basis, every city that made a decision that they wanted to defund the police have made an irreparable decision that is causing the people in those cities great harm. And uh, I would suggest that a good start to curtailing crime in your city would be to voice your opposition to the people that have the discretion of whether or not these people are prosecuted and to what extent they're prosecuted and what the end result is. Uh, you're going to hear such things as justice reinvestment, uh, you know, reinvestment in the community, those kind of... Folks, that stuff's been around for a long time. All we've done is renamed it, brought it out under a new thing. Uh, I'm not for mass incarceration, but you cannot keep allowing bad people out onto your streets recommitting more crimes. They drive the numbers up, they make your communities less safe. And it's very important that you as the elect... or you as the... Uh, community members and voters in your city that you put people in positions that are go going to make sure that you're safe. If that's not a priority to you, then that's okay. But I think most people want to go to bed at night not worrying about whether a stray bullet is going to come through their bedroom window. And with that, I'll hand it off to... Our Th thank you, Mr. Hall. I, I, can you go back two slides, Brad? Perfect. Uh, this is some alarming data to look at, and, and I'm not convinced that domestic assaults and sexual assaults are actually down. I think that um, since we're going back five years and we've been in uh, a COVID posture for the last two and a half, I mean, we were warned at the beginning of COVID that you would hear about an yeah. underreporting of domestic assaults left and right, and I think that this is proving it to us right here. I don't really think everybody just stopped abusing at home. Um, we have seen and heard anecdotally people who live in Burlington are very well aware that there has been a very intentional drive to teach people to not call the police for one reason or another, either because they felt that um, personally that the police weren't going to help in the situation or if that the police are already overtaxed and that they don't have the time to come, there has been an intentional push to teach people to not call and report when things have happened to them. And we hear it over time and time again on Front Porch Forum and on Facebook groups where people are posting that their bike was stolen or that they found somebody in their parking lot going through just checking to see if the doors were unlocked just so that way they could clear it out. I've been in this room many times before and so I think it's very important that you utilize the tools. If, something, if you are a victim of something, please make sure that you are reporting that crime because if you don't, then we aren't having a really fair conversation. A fair conversation comes about from having really accurate data, and so we need to have accurate data. So uh, uh, 
Thank you, Brad. We can jump to the next section. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, we're going to... to turn into qualified immunity. This is a really big subject, and I'm glad you're here to talk to us about it. Uh, Chris, thank you very much, and thank you to Keep Vermont Safe for having me here tonight. All right, we'll make sure that... All right, hopefully this is picking me up. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk about qualified immunity um, and just describe it for a little bit to set up this conversation as we go forward. Um, you might ask, what is qualified immunity? You may have heard about it in the papers, but it's not really described. Qualified immunity is a court-created defense that's available to federal officials who are accused of violating the federal constitution or federal law. Um, under this doctrine, the government officials can only be held liable for violating what are called clearly established constitutional and legal rights. Um, and it's important to note that it only bars monetary damages. It does not bar injunctive relief. Uh, next slide, please. So when is it used? Well, when state officials are sued under 42 USC section uh, 1983, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1871, uh, they are allowed to assert qualified immunity as a defense. Federal officials are also able to use it when they're sued under what's called the Bivens versus six unknown federal agents, uh, which is a court-created cause of action for violating U.S. constitutional rights or federal law. Uh, next, please. So how does it operate? What happens is the uh, plaintiff will bring a lawsuit against a federal official, and then the lawyers for that federal official or the state official will raise qualified immunity as an affirmative defense. It happens right at the start of the case. If it's successful, the defense allows the defendant to be released from the lawsuit at the very beginning, before discovery or before all the expensive parts of a lawsuit occur. Otherwise, its purpose would be totally undermined. Um, so the, the defense protects against not just liability, but the expense of litigation and the costs that come with that. Next, please. <clears throat> Uh, the way the courts decide whether qualified immunity applies is they, they employ a two-part test. The first part of the test asks, all right, under these alleged facts, do they show that the government official violated a constitutional or statutory right? If the answer is yes, then you move to the second part of the test. And the court asks, was this right clearly established? So the question is, if at the time of the alleged conduct, a reasonable official under all the same circumstances would not have believed that they were violating a clearly established right. If that's the case, then qualified immunity applies and the case is dismissed. Um, under Supreme Court precedent, clearly established means that there's a court decision or another court precedent that's saying that already says that similar conduct is illegal. So when you, when you raise the defense, you try to, you're saying that there's no other conduct like this, and uh, plaintiff's counsel are saying, yes, there is, here's a case that's just like this, and then you argue, and then the court makes a decision. Next, please. So this is part of what the court's rationale is, which is, um, have the officials been given fair notice that their conduct's unlawful? And if you look at the case law that talks about it, they talk about how it needs to be sufficiently clear so that every reasonable official would have understood that what they were doing was illegal and violated that right. And the, the Supreme Court looks at it and they say, hey, we need to give our government official, officials breathing room so that they can make reasonable but mistaken judgments about open legal questions. Next, please. And so that gets to the goal of qualified immunity. And this is where the court sort of rationalize the need to have immunity for government officials. And they said what we need to do is we need to balance the need to hold government ac officials accountable in, while we're minimizing the social costs of excessive litigation. And the social costs, is that they listed four social costs as they looked at it. And number one is the obvious one, which is the expense of litigation. Oh, come, come back to that slide, please. Uh, the other one is um, 
when, when a public official is sued, they're distracted from their official duties, and we don't want to distract them from what they're supposed to be doing and what they were hired for. And then the third point is that we do not want to deter qualified people from seeking public office. But the fourth side, the fourth element of this was what the court decided was the most important, which is we do not want to dissuade public officials from properly performing their duties, from being afraid to do their jobs because they're afraid they're going to be sued. Next, please. The critics claim that qualified immunity pre prevents people from having their day in court, that they, they're victims, if they're victims of police misconduct, they should have a right to have their cases heard when their rights have been violated. Uh, next, please. So in response to that criticism, uh, senators uh, introduced a bill called S-254, and I actually believe that one of the Chittenden Center's senators introduced this bill. Um, that bill, as introduced, would eliminate the defense of qualified immunity if any police officer is accused, accused of violating Vermont constitutional or statutory rights. It removed any limitations that exist in statute on liability, damages, or attorney's fees. Um, and it would make the city or the municipality responsible to pay those legal fees in any judgment except, and this is, this is an important important point. They wanted to make every law enforcement official potentially liable for $25,000 of any judgments that came in if, if their agency decided that they had acted in bad faith. Uh, next, please. So in, in the legislative process is an interesting process. What the legislature ended up doing is they watered it down considerably. They kicked the can into the next legislature. And so as passed, uh, the, the Vermont legislature just asked the Office of Legislative Council to submit by mid-November a, a legal analysis of both qualified immunity and S-254 as it was introduced. And this is another interesting part. The bill directs the Office of Legislative Council to, quote, not make any policy recommendations. Next, please. Uh, this is just a sampling of payouts in Vermont when people have um, sued to, uh, for police misconduct. From 2004 to 2014, over a quarter million dollars was paid out for alleged taser misuse. Uh, and then you have uh, three other cases that are examples where estates or people who are victims, alleged victims of police misconduct, sued and were able to get get uh, settlements from the, the state of the municip new municip excuse me, municipality. Uh, next, please. Uh, the Second Circuit is the federal circuit that is the um, appellate court for Vermont for federal cases. So in the Second Circuit, they've denied qualified immunity, meaning they defy denied this defense in eight out of ten of the most recent Excessive force, case, excessive force cases. So in 80% of the cases, they denied this defense. So you can see there's a, there's a list of denied cases. Most of them involve people who claim that they, they had succumbed to the police orders or they weren't resisting arrest or they were handcuffed or about to be handcuffed and they were beaten up or they were tased after they, sh after they had already uh, started obeying what the police officers were saying. There's another one where um, a sound gun was used against uh, alleged nonviolent protesters and that they claim they weren't warned. And um, that's, then there's another one that's a warrantless entry and use of a beanbag shotgun. And the courts allowed those to go forward without giving the defense of qualified immunity. Where it was granted, there was a case where handcuffs were used, but the person who was arrested never complained about the handcuffs. And the court said, well, if they didn't say anything, there's a reasonable officer would be right to think that the handcuffs may not have been tight, too tight and that they, their rights were not being violated. And in another case, a deaf, deaf student was tased. He was holding a rock in a menacing way, and he refused to obey sign language orders. Next, please. So the Vermont Supreme Court, and these are the state cases that are brought under state law, in the Vermont Supreme Court, there have been 12 cases addressing qualified immunity. Of those cases, the court denied immunity in three cases, allowed it in five, 
and never reached the issue in four cases because it wasn't necessary. In the case where it was denied, there was a, a welfare check that was performed on the wrong house, so a, the police went to the wrong house, and the people who were at the wrong house sued for their constitutional rights being violated. An, another one was um, a person was arrested uh, because he was in a discussion with a police officer, he used profanity, he was charged with disorderly conduct. And in Vermont, um, to its credit, it's a very strong First Amendment state, or Constitution is very strong about that. So the court said that that person should be able to sue. Another one uh, bystander was injured as a result of a high-speed chase and uh, reckless, what they claimed was reckless driving, and that officer was not entitled to um, immunity. Next, please. Or that may be it. Oh, here, here's a page where they're granted. So these are cases where the officer asserted the defense of qualif qualified immunity, said, hey, you can't bring a suit against me. You need to let me out at the beginning. And this was... And, and at this stage of the litigation, the plaintiff, every allegation they make in the complaint has to be believed and assumed true by the court. Uh, the first case involved an officer who was investigating a harassment case, and um, it's a, a tragic story where the complainant was murdered by the harasser, but there was no evidence of bad faith by the officer, so the court granted them immunity. Another, a mother sued after she was threatened with arrest for failing to follow court orders. Uh, the third case involved somebody who uh, was asked if they could be searched. They agreed to the search. They later regretted it and sued the officer. And the court said, a reasonable officer would be right to think if he asked to search your car and you say yes, that that would not be violating your, your rights. Um, the, the, the next one I think is my favorite. Uh, it was a person who was issued a warning by a game warden. So the game warden gave him a warning and said, um, I'm not going to issue you a ticket but you violated these game regulations, and the person turned around and sued because the game warden did not include his excuse for violating the regulation on the ticket. Uh, the next one, a person brought a gun into a police barracks, and there's a law that prohibits bringing firearms into a state institution, and the court said uh, that police officer is entitled to, a def to uh, qualified immunity. And that's, a, that's an overview of qualified immunity in Vermont. Terrific. So this is a subject that this is a subject that uh, is in the news a lot, and something that we hear a lot of Vermont politicians talking about, especially in the last two years. Um, but from what you had presented before, you know, twelve cases have made it to the Vermont Supreme Court, and it doesn't appear that it the the tool of qualified immunity is actually being abused in any way. It seems that the courts are actually fulfilling their obligation to keep it in check and really evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. So what would be the incentive or the push to, to eliminate it altogether? Because then you're, you're turning these, these officers into, um, You know, they, they, they have to answer to it, but they aren't able, to, their hands are tied, they don't have the ability to offer an appropriate defense if you're striking the ability to have that kind of defense. So what... Um, why, why would they do this? Yeah, why would they, why would they go about doing this? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I don't know how many people here have been through a lawsuit and accused of doing things um, improperly, accused of violating somebody's constitutional rights, but it's incredibly, incredibly stressful. And then... They want to add on to that the idea that the person would be personally liable for $25,000. Um, it's, it it's unfathomable to me that they would try to open our law enforcement officers to that kind of liability. And I guarantee they talk about Burlington having trouble recruiting officers. If they pass this law, every single police department in Vermont will, will probably drain itself of, of any sort of talent and they'll never be able to recruit somebody to serve and serve as a police officer in the state. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Chris, if I could weigh in on that. Uh, sure. You know, this, this discussion is focused on law enforcement and immunity, uh, but this immunity that the, we're talking about here applies to almost every, if not all, government official. So you know, uh, the immunity that we're talking about being sued 
applies to your town clerk, your zoning administrator, your mayor, all of the people that work in government. It's not just the police. And for them to single out a single profession, one isn't right. Uh, two, probably, I'm, I don't know if this is illegal, but uh, I can tell you that this discussion from my end of it and from what I've heard from law enforcement people is that if the state of Vermont does that, you will see an exodus from law enforcement probably comparable to what you're seeing here in Burlington, but on a statewide level. Uh, and uh, what I will tell you is you will hear some people tell you, well, Colorado does it, or this place does it, and there's a quick fix that the police can go out and take out a, an insurance policy and that city can pay the policy or the officer can, and then it's only a couple hundred bucks a year. Well, I, I don't know if that's the case, and if it is, it'll probably last for a little bit until the insurance companies get paying out more than what they should. And my question is, let's say that this were to be the case, what happens when you off end up with an officer that is sued and the insurance company decides to settle the claim because it's more advantageous, advantageous to them financially, and all of a sudden that officer is not able to obtain the kind of insurance that they need. Now you're saddled with an officer that can't be insured, but he's still an employee. The cities and towns are going to be on the hook for this. Don't be fooled by what they're playing games here. Bottom line is they're going to go after the deep pockets, and this is just the first step of making that a lot easier. The officers just happen to be in the way. Can I just add, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I will also say that the very legislators that want to take qualified immunity away from the police enjoy it for themselves. Anybody think a legislator's ever made a bad decision? Well, they can't be sued for those decisions. And when they pass, when they write these laws to take away qualified immunity for the police, they specifically say, nothing about this is meant to get rid of our legislative immunity. I, I actually, that's a great point. And I was, I was gonna make a similar point. If you don't mind, I'll slipstream behind that. Whenever I do public records requests to state legislators, they always assert their immunity from the laws that they make the rest of us abide by. They always do it. It's right in the, the second paragraph, right after they acknowledge having received the request. Wow. Okay. Um, this is a really fascinating subject, and it is always, always interesting how some of the loudest voices talking about reforms are always quick to make sure that it's, that it's not theirs taken away. Um, fascinating. This will bring us to our, perfect, our next subject, which is uh, providing law enforcement um, and prosecutors appropriate tools through legislative action. And, and with that, um, Ms. Nolan. Thank you, for, uh, Christopher, and thank you. And thank you to um, Keep Vermont Safe for having me. It's an honor to be invited. And I can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, things are worse than they have ever been in Burlington. Let's just call a spade a spade. It has never been this bad, and the trends are terrifying. I grew up in Westford, Vermont, northern Chittenden County. One of the most fun things we did as kids is come to Burlington, uh, walk around on Church Street, in and out of the shops. Um, every day I hear parents tell me they would never let their teenagers walk on Church Street anymore. And it's worse than that. The parents themselves say, I just don't go to Burlington anymore. And our beautiful city, we can't have this. And so, but I want to be here tonight with a message of hope. Because uh, at 6 o'clock on a Friday night, when I see this many people come together, by the way, from different backgrounds, because I can see people from different backgrounds and different viewpoints in this room, I have tremendous hope. We're not giving up. We're going to turn this around. So I uh, really appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, so how do, what are the tools we need? Well, the first, the first thing we need to do is get our head count back up uh, in, uh, certainly in the Burlington Police Department, but also in the state police. It is frightening how depleted the state police is, and of course the state police supports local law enforcement. They're having a much harder time doing it these days because their numbers are so far down, and they made a statement recently 
that I know I would never would have heard them say a few years ago, which is that please, local law enforcement, don't call us unless it's a last resort. That's not something they ever would have said in 2019 or even 2020 when I was U.S. Attorney. They were eager to support local law enforcement, but everybody's so depleted in the ranks um, that they can't collaborate in the ways they used to. We must have funded police departments. Uh, the decision to defund the police has caused extraordinary damage. It's the reason we're sitting here tonight. I have heard that the city council is taking steps to reverse the decision. But the extraordinary damage has already been done. I, I, keep the, I, hope they keep, I, I hope they keep heading in the right direction, but the damage has been done, and it's why we're sitting here tonight. So we need to, uh, we need to fund the police. We, they need to feel supported. I noticed in the, government, uh, the governor's 10-point plan for public safety, which I applaud him for putting out. I think it was a good roadmap, and it's good to have a roadmap in writing. Um, uh, we need to, he, he noted that we could bring back retirees, people who left the police force, they retired early because they didn't feel supported. They're gonna need some incentives to come back and the first thing they're gonna need is people in leadership, regular citizens, community leaders supporting them. They're not gonna come back if they don't feel supported. I just spoke, uh, I was honored and privileged to speak at the Peace Officers Memorial Ceremony in Pittsburgh uh, earlier today just came from Pittsburgh. This is the ceremony to honor fallen officers. And there were police officers and family and loved ones crying at that ceremony today. And please support your police officers. We have two excellent ones in the room today. Um, I worked with, I've worked with both of them, they're tremendous. Um, give them a hug, thank them when you see them, wave to them when they go by in their cruiser. If you're a prayer, pray for them. Um, they're wonderful people. We need, to get them, we need to get our head counts back up so that they can apprehend criminals, prevent crime, and bring consequences to offenders. Um, another reason we need full staffing for police departments is because of special investigative units. So all of the departments uh, have specialty units sexual assault units, drug units, um, major crimes units. Uh, certainly I did a lot of work with the drug unit at the Burlington Police Department and people like uh, then Detective Chenette. Um, they do wonderful work, but when their head counts down, they have to pull people out of those specialty units. So when you see uh, rise in drug trafficking and overdose death, remember that that's because the police are down head count and people are being pulled off of those specialty units. This is true in the state police too, which supports the Burlington police and local uh, police departments. The state police drug task force has been drastically depleted, um, as has their major crimes unit and their uh, basic crimes uh, unit, drastically depleted because they have to pull people out of these specialty units because their head count is down. So uh, it's another reason. And then a, a final reason um, is task forces. Uh, task forces, um, what I mean by that is local police will uh, send somebody to be embedded with one of the federal agencies, like DEA or ATF um, or HSI or FBI. And they'll sit with those federal agents every day. And the reason for this is the local police have the intel about who the bad actors are, who the recidivists are, who needs to be focused on by the feds. And the local police start the case on the ground and work it up with the feds. But, and the same is true of the state police, the state police send these task force officers too, but what's happening is um, that the state police and the local police are pulling their people off these task forces because they don't have enough people to do the basic work. So the coordination that's also mentioned in the governor's 10 point plan, we need to coordinate federal, state, and local law enforcement, is suffering very badly because of the police being defunded and demoralized and not feeling supported and leaving this state or retiring early. I don't know why my microphone's buzzing, but we'll get closer. Okay, okay. Can I, can, you can't hear me? Okay, okay. Um, well, hopefully you didn't miss all my talk about task forces and um, special investigative units. Um, I, last thing I'll say before moving to the next topic is um, mental health services treatment and prevention efforts. 
I've talked to law enforcement officers for years and why they want support and they know we have to enforce the law and hold criminals accountable. They say we can't do it alone. We need to get people into treatment. We need to prevent young people from using drugs in the first place. We need to, pre we need to do violence prevention efforts, get into communities and start early with young people on violence prevention. Um, so it has to be a holistic approach, and law enforcement will be the first ones to tell you, we're not social workers, we're not mental health counselors, we're not drug treatment providers. We need help from these communities, and we all need to be working together and supporting each other. Uh, next, next, I'll mention technology. Technology is a force multiplier. Um, when the police have, uh, are equipped with the latest and greatest law enforcement technology, they can do more work more efficiently. So one of the things that comes to mind immediately is forensics, computer and cell phone forensics. Every uh, police department in the state needs people who are trained on the Cellbrite machine. A cell, Cellbrite machine is a machine that reads the phones, dumps the data, dumps the data from the computers. We need people trained on the Cellbrite machine um, and we need funding for Cellbrite machines in every state. And there are other t ways to search computers and phones that we need in every department in Vermont. When I was a prosecutor, a line assistant, before I was US attorney, I did cases where we had to ship phones out of state for somebody to search them, because we didn't have the capabilities in Vermont. And let me tell you, these phones are a prosecutor's dream. Um, the, people store a lot of stuff in their phone, and you can prove a case very quickly um, with the contents of a phone or a computer. People just don't, they forget to delete things. Um, and let's not remind them to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be reviewing my own phone tonight. Uh, so so we, need, we need people trained in um, com computer and phone forensics, um, and we need Cellbrite machines in every um, department in Vermont, and uh, ballistics training and cap uh, analysis capabilities. I had a case as an assistant U.S. attorney where we, the, it, crucial to proving the case was matching the bullet with the weapon, which was discovered fortuitously. Um, and we need people trained on a ballistics analysis. It, the ATF will support local law enforcement on this, but it, it would be great to have local law enforcement with these capabilities in-house. Next, I'll talk about um, updating the laws uh, to reflect, reflect the reality on the ground. Um, as U.S. attorney, I testified before the United States Senate Judiciary Committee on fentanyl penalties. Uh, fentanyl is the drug that is killing over, you know, nearly 100,000 Americans a year and, you know, over 200 Vermonters a year, thereabouts, uh, as of late. It is incredibly deadly. Uh, as of right now, and two milligrams of fentanyl, which is the size of two grains of salt, will kill the average person. Yeah. So, so very takes very little fentanyl for someone to overdose and die. Think about two grains of salt. Right now, a federal prosecutor can't charge a five-year mandatory minimum, a five-year sentence, unless they have 40 grams of fentanyl that they can prove. Now, now that is 20,000 lethal doses. Fentanyl does, when it reaches a consumer state like Vermont, a consumption state like Vermont, it's the end of the line, it's usually in fairly small quantities because it doesn't take a lot to get high and it doesn't take a lot for the drug dealer to make money and they're usually selling other drugs like crack cocaine or sadly methamphetamine these days. I am not saying everyone should get a five-year jail sentence, but prosecutors ought to be able to charge something more than zero based on less than 20,000 lethal doses. And I asked the United States Senate to fix that um, in 2018, and I'm still waiting. Um, and then the other, uh, the other troubling thing is, there are things called fentanyl analogs, which are, are usually deadlier than fentanyl. Things like car fentanyl, um, that are 100 times, can be 100 times more deadly than fentanyl. Uh, Congress, has failed to permanently list um, fentanyl analogs as a, as a controlled substance. And this is the other thing I asked them to do when I testified as U.S. Attorney. I don't understand it. Um, and the DEA has to emergency schedule them. Every year we go through um, the process of wondering whether Congress will extend the temporary scheduling. Just get them scheduled. They're deadlier than fentanyl. There's absolutely no reason that they're not scheduled now. And there should be no partisanship about this issue. Um, 
so I'll go on to, and I'm not going to talk about the Analog Act because that's a little wonky, but if we want to talk about it in Q&A, we can. Um, the Analog Act is what you would have to use if the fentanyl analogs weren't scheduled, and it's incredibly cumbersome, and it would slow down law enforcement and prosecutors. Um, state laws. Our bail uh, system is uh, not working in Vermont. It is a catch and release system. Um, it's, there's no one person or set of people to blame. Judges have to make the right decisions. Prosecutors have to ask uh, for the right things when it comes to bail. But what I would like to see is bail reform, true bail reform in Vermont to mirror the federal system. In the federal system, there is no money in it. And I, I like that. Now, if all you have is cash bail as a prosecutor, you have to use it. But in the federal system, you walk into court, and if you can show a judge that a person is a risk of flight, or a danger to the community, they go to jail, there's no money involved, and they wait for their trial. And that's the way I think it should be in the state level. Um, get the money out of it if they're a risk of flight or a danger to the community, and it has to be written that danger to the community can be showed just by the nature of the offense. So I had somebody held pending trial because I had strong evidence that he shot another person and killed them. He had no prior record, he was young, family support, but you could still get somebody held in the federal system just based on the nature of the offense. The other thing is, uh, for state laws, this was just in the news, uh, I think in the, the Vermont Digger. Um, they, there is a need to do something about the gap we, where somebody is found not guilty by reason of insanity. And by the way, that determination needs to be found by a jury, not guilty by reason of insanity. And if they're found not guilty by reason of insanity, they shouldn't just go out on the streets. In the federal system, that's not what happens. Somebody can be found not guilty by reason of insanity, but that they go into a facility, a secure facility, an inpatient facility, where they're treated until they're better. And that is the humane thing to do, and that is the right public safety approach. And it's the same for those who are um, found incompetent to stand trial. They need to be treated in the same facility, maybe a different wing, until they're competent to stand trial. Um, the next topic I want to have talk about is um, let's not have um, see the next uh, let's uh, let's I'm, I'm asking for state legislators and local uh, city councilors, uh, Burlington City Council included. I understand you may be acting in good faith and that you may be doing your best, but too much of what you're doing is counterproductive, and it's undermining law enforcement. And I, I, don't, I, want, I want us to start listening to each other and just and acknowledging people of good faith can disagree, but what you're doing, everything, too, everything that comes out on criminal justice seems undermining and counterproductive to me. There is a move to open drug injection facilities. Um, it's been going on for years. I've been talking about it for years. Um, we are not going to solve the drug crisis anywhere, including in Burlington, by giving people a place to inject fentanyl fentanyl analogs, methamphetamine, crack cocaine, they use all the drugs at these, and then send them on their way. They don't get into treatment when they go to these there's, because there's this idea you don't judge, and I'm not into stigma and judgment, but this will not work. They had to close one of these in San Francisco because it doesn't work. And so I would ask that we focus on treatment and prevention, preventing young people from using, not telling them it's okay to use, not giving them a place to use, preventing them from using and getting people into treatment. I don't believe in charging everybody. I would rather see prevention work and treatment work. Am I going on too long? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, so let's not, let's stop with that. Let, let's please, I would, I would urge us to stop with decriminalization movement of drugs um, and, and, and legalization of drugs. The simple truth is if you decriminalize and legalize drugs, more people are gonna use them. That's why more people use alcohol and cigarettes than they do drugs. Um, if you think about how deadly fentanyl is, if you think about how deadly heroin, oxycodone, all these drugs, I, I can't understand why there would be a movement to legalize them. Um, that doesn't mean we don't uh, get people into treatment and work toward treatment when they are using. Um, another thing that's going on is a movement to um, uh, legalize prostitution. That is the last thing Burlington needs. Um, I, I prosecuted a case, I oversaw the prosecution of one of the worst human traffickers uh, in, in the history of the country as U.S. attorney. He was forcing young drug addicted women, including some children, into prostitution. One of the tools law enforcement can get, use to get to horrible people like that, he's doing 25 years in jail, jail. he horribly abused these people. <laughs> Uh, 
one of the, to the critical tools that law enforcement needs um, to, to investigate the people who do this uh, is to be able to investigate prostitution. That's how you get to the human traffickers. Uh, but more than that, or it's one of the critical ways to search hotel rooms, to search back page uh, pages, you can't do that unless prostitution is a crime. Um, but we're also going to attract human traffickers to Vermont, and more women are going to be raped and abused in prostitution contexts if this is legal, because the abuser is just going to say, well, it was a legal transaction. So I, I urge us to really think about this and not move in this direction. The last thing I'll mention on... on uh, the legislative front is expungement. We are very concerned about people possessing guns who should not possess them. But when you expunge convictions and seal uh, juvenile records, the relevant information doesn't get into the background checks. So I, th I think, again, while this may feel like a well-meaning movement, what's happening is people are, are possessing guns who shouldn't, um, to, and sometimes to tragic consequence, and law enforcement is going into situations where they don't know the criminal record of the person, the true criminal record of the person um, that they're going to be interacting with. And employers are hiring people, and they have no idea what their background is. I, you know, I would think if I was in medical care, for example, and somebody had diverted oxycodone once before, you might not want to hire them you know, to be around oxycodone. Now, maybe you would give them a second chance. I actually encourage employers to do that. But they ought to have the relevant information. And, um, you know, I could go on a little, you, okay, okay. The state, court, the state court system, I always feel like I talk too long. The state court system needs to get back and working again. I know that there are people trying on this front, um, but the state court system appears to be behind every other sector, every other kind of walk of life um, when, it, when it comes to being fully post-COVID up and running. And so c cases aren't getting tried. Um, this isn't fair to the defendant by the way, any more than it is to the community. Um, there, there are people out on the streets who are supposed to be going through the state criminal justice process, and they're not, the state courts are just not fully up and running. And so I would, I would say that, um, and, and the governor mentioned this in his 10-point plan as well, I would say that the state court system does more, far more essential work than the movie theater, the beauty parlor, or the grocery store. Well, the grocery store is pretty important, but... <laughs> The criminal justice system should not be last in, in moving forward post-COVID. And then finally, the Attorney General's office. I would encourage the Attorney General's office and the, uh, the next Attorney General to um, start, start charging drug cases, drug trafficking cases. And the way, the way you do this, um, the, the Attorney General's office um, can, they can charge any state crime. So they need to, I would encourage them to start working um, with the Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office and the Burlington Police and any other hot spot for drug trafficking in Vermont and gun violence in Vermont and start taking some of these cases. Start taking them um, to the Attorney General's Office and prosecuting them there. Um, and, and certainly Burlington, uh, I think, could use um, some special help and special treatment from the Attorney General's Office. So. <laughs> That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. I actually have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, let's start here. So regarding staffing levels and task forces, uh, due to the lack of officers available for tax, task forces, does, has that resulted in a decline in federal prosecutions? Well, you would have to ask the United States Attorney, but I can't imagine that it's, it's helping them prosecute cases. Right. Um, the, so, so many of the wonderful cases we did did not start with the federal agencies. They started at the local level, and then the feds got interested, um, and then they started collaborating. Um, the, the feds have investigative capabilities that the locals certainly don't have, um, and when they work together, it is... It is uh, you know, the best you, can, you, the best you can have in law enforcement is when the feds and the locals work together. So when you don't have that local officer embedded with the, with, uh, the DEA, you're not going to do the caliber of drug cases in, in Burlington that you should be doing. Terrific. And so uh, a follow-up question to your, um, your comments on bail reform. How... I understand that you made a point that we should reform so that way it's... Um, 
their, the individual is held if they are a flight risk or a threat to themselves or the community. Um, would we, should we also consider working out a plan for court diversion, um, especially when cases of, of drug addiction and how, you know, addiction's terrible and it affects everybody from every walk of life, from every socioeconomic background and from the entire political spectrum. Would we need to put in more institutions or have more support structures in the state through treatment facilities, inpatient, um, expanded halfway houses, um, so that way we could have a more robust probationary system that is there to support and, and, and help people up as opposed to just leaving them out the way that we have now. You did mention that we have uh, this, this uh, catch and release program and I personally find that to be absolutely inhumane. I mean, the person who suffers from addiction is absolutely suffering. Uh, they suffer daily, they suffer sometimes hourly from it and, and to allow them or just tolerate them being able to use and continue to abuse themselves in the community that they're in without and being able to be there as a community to offer support and the, the pathway to personal redemption. Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. We need, we need an all of the above approach. We need to give prosecutors all the tools available. Um, some of the proudest cases I did were the cases where I said, I don't think jail time is necessary here. And I think this person's crime, you know, maybe it was a first time crime, it was fueled by addiction. And what they really need is a second chance and treatment. And I believe in that. Um, but you have to have the resources right. to do it. Um, one of the cases that comes to mind, a, a man I prosecuted for um, very serious gun uh, trafficking and drug trafficking crimes. Um, he got treatment and he's six years sober and we're friends now. Um, and and he, he, he credits, well he credits being prosecuted um, and uh, you know, thanks me for that, which I find remar remarkable and humbling. Um, but he also went to a nine month inpatient treatment program. Now he had to go to New Hampshire to go to that. Um, I think Valley Vista does a wonderful job. I've toured Valley Vista. I know people who work there, but the program is short and some people need uh, longer term options. So I think we do need those options in Vermont. I think the state system needs probation with real teeth. I'll tell you the federal probation officers, you don't get anything past them. And if you're not complying, they'll give you some chances, they'll work with you, but at the end of the day, if you're not willing to work with them, you will go back, you will go to jail in a wait trial. There are actually a number of state laws that prohibit sober houses and other uh, opportunities to build communities for people to get sober, be sober, stay sober. So there is actually, there, there were some folks who were trying to push to have those regulations overturned, uh, but we do have shocking, right? I think many of you hear me talk about this all the time. Government is often the problem where there is this idea, right, there's laws in place in theory to protect people, however, you're protecting them so well that they're just living on the street instead, and that can't be a solution. Yeah, it's, it's a real shame. We, we in Burlington had a halfway house closed down last year, and I, I personally know many people who have benefited from the structured environment of, um, of halfway houses to help them rebuild their lives after coming out of addiction and, and to not have that, to just say, go do you. Um, yeah. Well, and that's it, what Christina said. Valley Vista is only a two week program. So if you're a heroin addict and your whole family is addicts, dealers, criminals, and whatever, which oftentimes is the case, do you think that you're just gonna like dry out for two weeks, get out and be fine? No, it doesn't work that way. And, and I do credit, you know, a lot of why when I got out of prison, I had a place to go that was safe. I had a family that loved me. They were kind of tired of my nonsense, but they still loved me. And, but there are some people that I was in prison with that had no family or their entire family were literally criminals. And so if we say, okay, well then now your, your, your halfway house is basically on the street, go figure it out, and then we're confused or surprised that they have unfortunate circumstances with police officers or with other members of the community. You know, we, we don't get to make poor decisions like that and then be surprised by the outcome. This will bring us to our, oh perfect, you're already there. Thank you, sir. Uh, this brings us to our fourth panel. 
which is how is law and order being restored in other states? And so this is open for all of us to really kind of chime in. Um, we hear a lot of talk about the cahoots model and how important it is to try and take some of the pressure off the backs of law enforcement that they that they should not be responsible for dealing with everything that they have to deal with during the course of their day today. And one of the best ways to do that would be to have uh, social workers or, or community service officers to actually try and do more street outreach and try and connect with people. What are your opinions on the CAHOOTS model that's being employed in, uh, I believe, Eugene, Oregon? Is that? It's in Oregon, correct? I don't Eugene? know. That's a good yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Those kind of programs sound good and they're really effective. I can think of a couple of cases where uh, we had something similar to that in Bennington County for a brief period of time. But the problem with those kind of models is typically they start them up, they're funded and operated by a very small staff. And although effective, they generally run Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Mm -hmm. And that's not when they're needed necessarily. Yeah. You know, you're talking about employing these folks out into the field to work with law enforcement. They need to be available 24-7, 365. Because there's a lot of good resources out there, but they're only available during specific hours and days of the week. And... You know, unfortunately, that's not when some of these crises take place. Most of them are on a Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock, and there's nobody available. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know you folks in the northern part of the state here are, are a little better positioned with, like, the Howard Center and some of those places. But I can tell you, like, in Bennington County, come Friday afternoon at 430 or any day of the week at 4.30, you're kind of going to be out of luck getting a hold of anyone from mental health services or whatever. So then what happens is we resort to, you know, taking them to the hospital, which typically they're not staffed or equipped to deal with a lot of these situations. And then what happens is the police agency, and I'm talking from my own experience, ends up with an officer tied up with this individual at an ER center or something like that for several hours, if not longer. And they're very good programs, don't get me wrong. But they, I'm sure they cost money, they need to be implemented, but they have to be done on a 24-7, 365 basis. You also will hear from nurses and staff in the ER uh, or at the mental health facility at UVM they have to get, I, my understanding is they have to get a judge to order medication if a person is having a mental break. So if somebody goes in, we saw the chart at the beginning, right? A lot of these incidences are happening overnight on a Saturday or Sunday. And if you have to wait for a judge to be able to give medication to sedate someone who's having a psychic break, so our ER nurses are being assaulted and having to assault these people to restrain them and then sometimes wait for a day or more to get permission from the judge to, to sedate them. Yeah, it's very inhumane. Well, I, I think if, if I could, Erica, you know, one of the things the state talks and our legislature, they talk a good story about the things that they're going to do and they're gonna create beds for mental health uh, reasons and those kind of things. And, you know, quite frankly, since Waterbury, since the hospital there after Irene was flooded and out of uh, commission, they really haven't done a heck of a lot. And they really, the bottom line is they don't have any place to put these people for the most part. So, been my experience, what happens, we run them to the ER, they get maybe hospitalized for a few days, they get uh, given drugs, they get kicked out the door, things go well until they feel good again and don't take their medication and then we're right back to phase one. Yep. Uh, no follow-up, no continuation of treatment 
or uh, assistance beyond that crisis. I, I just want to quickly uh, uh, piggyback on that. The ER cannot take the place of inpatient yes. mental health care. Um, that is unconscionable. Um, in particular, I think about our youth, our adolescents. There's only one place for them to go inpatient in Vermont, and that's the Brattleboro Retreat. And they've had their COVID issues. Uh, they've had their staffing issues. They only have so many beds. And you have children sitting in the emergency room who are in acute mental health crisis if we're going to spend some money, let's make sure we're taking care of our kids. Yes. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's constantly heartbreaking to hear about how we have a mental health crisis in the state, in the, especially in the last few years, and yet we have not seen monies allocated to open up new facilities and ensure that there's new treatment. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's truly upsetting. So, this brings me to um, expansion of drug courts. I and mean, we're talking about what are other states doing to try and restore law and order. What are other states doing uh, when it comes to, to dealing with this epidemic of addiction that's flooding across the, uh, coming across the nation or the mental health crisis? What are other states doing it? And, and I understand like probably number one of each one of your answers would be we need to open up a new facility. Uh, but in addition to that, if that's the baseline, wh where would you like us to go with this? What are your recommendations? Because addiction, like we said, it, it probably has touched every single person in this room in one way or another. How can we get ahead of this or at least stop trying being behind it? I guess what, what jumps immediately to mind is uh, prevention efforts, um, certainly when it comes to young people, um, but of course, people of all ages. Um, if we can um, get to young people, especially with a message of hope, um, young people struggle more than we know. It's just, it's just the truth. It's just not easy to be a young person these days. School's not easy, the internet's not easy, kids aren't always good to each other, and they turn to drugs. Um, and so we have to get to them with a message of why this is not a good decision. Um, it's, I don't think fear tactics really work these days. I think um, what I did was bring my friend Justin, who I mentioned, two kids and have him talk about his story. And it has to be a message of hope. Um, if you're struggling, you know, in, in, in your inner self, um, or if you've already turned to drugs or you know somebody that has, um, there are, uh, there is hope. There's treatment, there's support, there are people who want to help you. Um, we all have to remember this in our interactions with addicted people. Every interaction that we have can change somebody's life. Yeah. Um, and we need to treat each other well and extend our hand to people. Um, doesn't mean we don't hold them accountable. That's part of loving somebody. Um, but we also need to remember that um, every interaction we have can change the course of somebody's life. And then the other message, of course, needs to be, it's don't try, these, don't try an opioid in the first place. Sure. Whatever you think, whatever immediate gratifi gratification you think you're going to get, you can lose your whole life your freedom, your future. Um, so I think, and the governor has, has, has done a good job working on this. I sat on his opioid coordination council, which became a substance use prevention council. Everybody from every walk of life came together um, to talk about how we could get to our youth and to everybody with a message of prevention. You know, law enforcement doesn't want to arrest people. Nobody wants people in jail. We'd rather have people not turn to drugs and then to violence and then to theft in the first place. So I think um, a focus on prevention uh, would be important. Thank you. I, um, yeah, this is a, is a difficult subject. It, it's, it's heartbreaking at times and it's really troublesome. And you know, I think that one of the reasons we've come together today was to talk about the, not just the problems that we're facing as a community, but where do we move from here? And uh, just like the topic of your panel suggested, um, a lot of these could be legislative fixes. We tend to have um, issues when it comes to what the law states and how that kind of hamstrings us at times. And truth be told, if we want bail reform, if we want to make it so that way we change the way and the nature of the catch and release program in the state so that way we have something that is 
um, holding an individual that is a threat to themselves or others and not just a flight risk. Now is the time because we do have an election coming up in November and there are a lot of candidates out there that are asking for your vote. So, and they're having events, you know, not necessarily like this, but maybe they are having community events in your town. Go to them and raise your hand and ask questions and ask them, please, what are you going to do on day one to restore public safety? Because this isn't just a Burlington problem. We might be the red center of the bullseye on this, but there are staffing issues and, and public safety issues all around Vermont in every municipality. So we are not alone here. We might be the worst case scenario at this point, but it's it's all upon you. And one of the reasons why we decided to hold these, these um, discussions was one, to impart wisdom, but two, to try to impress upon you the importance of reaching out and asking all these candidates that are out there right now asking for your vote for the Vermont State House, ask them what they're going to do to restore public safety, to support the police and to support mm -hmm. your communities. Take it even farther, ask them when are you going to show up and repeal whatever regulations are stopping new drug treatment facilities from coming into the state? Ask them, it's the perfect time to do it because they want your vote and there are lots of other people in the room. So- And people, when I talk to people, you know, the Chittenden County State's Attorney has a lot of power over what she and her department decide to prosecute. People did not know that that is an elected office. People did not know that that was something that we vote for. And so, I don't know if we can, if we can, <laughs> do an effective write-in campaign by November, but um, you know, this is, your vote matters. Elections matter. And so the next time you talk to somebody and they tell you don't, they don't vote because it doesn't matter, you let, especially if they live in Chittenden County, you can say, well, just so you know, you not voting and you not participating in your own self-governance is contributing to things being unsafe and the rise in murders and drug trafficking and everything else. Like, lives are actually on the line with your ballot this November. And, and I want to make sure people understand that and take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. We're actually going to open it up right now to the audience questions. So if anybody... Eric will be right over. Make sure you talk right into the microphone so we can all hear you. This is probably a dumb question, but um, are there ways to have treatment in the prison system? I mean, it's, you know, they have the time, <laughs> and can they, is there any, is that something that's current, or is that something that could be done? Because there you have a facility and a bunch of people with time, <laughs> and then it would behoove the judges and whatnot to get people into jail if they had a successful system within the prison system. Is that possible, and is that something that can be done? That Vermont passed a law to give um, drug users, alcohol and heavier drugs, drugs like uh, methadone while they're imprisoned, great. We're gonna wean them off of said drugs slowly, right? To get them so that they're, no, they never get weaned off. Does anybody want to talk about um, medically assisted treatment or treatment while incarcerated? Um, treat, on treatment while incarcerated, that is an excellent question, and there is some of that. Um, Northwest has an excellent program that uh, Judge Christina Rice uh, and worked with UVM to, uh, feder she's a federal judge, worked with UVM to lead the way in rolling out up in um, St. Albans, up at Northwest. And um, I absolutely think that we should be uh, giving people, uh, so people can avail themselves of anger management treatment, mental health counseling, drug treatment while in jail. Um, and I think we need to uh, see that model spread throughout the state. I had a defendant once, uh, a, a drug trafficking defendant, he cooperated. When he was, he was housed in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts before he came to Vermont. In Springfield, Massachusetts, he was getting all kinds of programming. 
Um, when he got to Vermont, he was doing nothing all day. And he told me, and this was someone who sin sincerely wanted to improve you know, and be better and, and get a second chance. He told me he missed being in Massachusetts because he could, he could do things uh, that he wanted to do to try to make, get ready for life outside. I mean, let's not forget, these people are coming back to us, most of them. And if we can get them um, help and resources while in prison, um, sure, d d right, I totally agree. Yeah. It's another tool that we need. Medically assisted treatment, I think it works for some people. I think it, and I think some people uh, prefer the AA model and uh, the abstinence model. I've always said, let's not, let's not um, have a fight in the treatment community. If people can get well, my friend Justin, who's six years sober, he started on medically assisted treatment. I believe it works for people. I believe we need an all, above, uh, all of the above approach uh, to treatment. And yeah. I will say another, another reason why to be thoughtful about uh, voting, they shut down all of the services in the prisons because of COVID. So no meetings could go in, no Bible studies, all of the things that give people hope and help them get well, uh, they're just barely some of them starting to come back. So, so there, and then in Windsor, it, they did have a work facility, but Vermont does not want to fund uh, incarceration. They don't want to fund uh, rehabilitation in that way. So, so we're prioritizing. We're putting money other places. Chris, uh, sorry, Miss Nolan. Uh, there's um, medically assisted treatment is is helpful for some people that are suffering through opi opioid addiction. But there is no medically assisted treatment. Uh, for methamphetamine addiction, is there? It's, it's absolutely true, and that's why I worry about um, the rise of meth in Burlington, um, which if you look at Burlington police data, we're seeing a big increase, um, as I understand it, uh, in seizures of meth. Uh, I don't know if it's Vermont State Police or Burlington Police, but when I was in my time as U.S. Attorney, over the years, steadily, we saw an increase in meth seizures in Vermont. Meth is such a destructive drug, um, it makes people violent. They go into psychosis, hallucinations. They don't sleep for days. Um, they abandon their families. They don't eat. Um, it's a terrible, terrible drug, and there is no medically assisted treatment um, for it. And I do want to emphasize, though, medically assisted is the key word. We don't just have the drug and people taking the drug. Um, you need wraparound services, um, uh, regular visits with a doctor, regular drug testing, counseling, vocational help. Um, it's not just you take a pill and go on your way. It's medically assisted treatment. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Erica. You mentioned that you were in Windsor. Um, if you could just give me an idea, because I don't know what the program was for you, and um, to someone else's point about treatment and learning a trade, I talked to Bill Huff, who was in a debate in a previous uh, race political race, and he said it after a debate, someone who was an inmate at Windsor approached him after the debate and begged him if he got elected to please reopen it because he did learn a trade and he was being a productive member of society like you mentioned. So it was working and it needs to get put back into service. Yeah, Windsor was a, a originally a working farm, actually. So this was before I got there. But previously, they were people were made to work on the farm. They had to feed themselves. They had to do the whole thing. So when I was there, a lot of that had already been closed down. But there was, a, like, Vermont Works for Women or something like that. They were teaching a construction trade. They were making uh, road signs and all of that other stuff. There was Bible study. There was 12-step groups. There was whatever you wanted. If you wanted help, you could get it. Um, now, uh, and now the thing to remember too is it's all voluntary, right? So, so there are programs at North, uh, what is it, Northwestern, you said in St. Albans? Uh, there are probably programs, but you have to elect to be into them. So they can't force inmates to participate and get well. So as an example, just for everybody's sake, anybody who tells you that women should be decarcerated the question that I've asked, I, my cellmates were in for murder and attempted murder. Which of those people should not have been incarcerated? I, I'm, I'm sincere. And, and unfortunately, part of the issue is that the way our facilities are set up, everybody, it didn't matter if you were violent or nonviolent, everybody was kind of wrapped up together. 
So it's just, it's been a pro and we were overcrowded. There was only supposed to be two people per cell and we had five. So now I don't know if it's still the same, you know, that was seven, 17 years ago. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the circumstances are in St. Albans, but they don't even want to let people in there. There was not that option then. I don't know if there currently is. Hi, I'm Michael Belowski with Two North Reports. Um, this question can be for anyone on the panel or yourself. Um, there was a recent Wall Street Journal commentary by the mayor of uh, Maryland, Larry Hogan. Uh, the, he was writing mostly about the West Coast and Washington State and Oregon, but his idea was to fix cities across the country where maybe their beliefs resulted in them in engaging in the defund movement and doing what Burlington did and so many cities did. They, governors can use the state police, as we saw here somewhat already, to alleviate those cities, and that's what apparently he did during 2020 when a lot of the other major cities in the country were burning or getting looted. And I, I think it was the mayor of Baltimore, he wrote, had instructed his police to stand down and let these riots continue. And he said, no way. And he got the National Guard and the state police to go into Baltimore and prevent th what happened in much of the rest of the country during, uh, this was like that tough stretch in 2020. So, so I guess my question is, do you think we should utilize this more? I know the governor already had state police here uh, already this year, but is this a way to continue? That's a good question. So I would say state police or the Vermont Guard, Vermont National Guard even. Could either of those be utilized? Well, I think you're talking about uh, Governor Larry Hogan from Maryland. Um, and the mayor of Baltimore had said that she wanted to let the rioters um, go ahead and riot and get it out of their systems, and he said that wasn't going to happen. Um, I think Christina touched on it earlier, talking about how there are, other, there are other state resources available, and the Attorney General of Vermont has authority, the same authority that every state's attorney has, so the, the new Attorney General could, could divert some of their resources that they've now devoted to some, of the, some other things that may should have maybe should have less priority, and then put a task force on prosecuting drug crimes throughout the state and assist these state's attorneys that are clearly overwhelmed. I mean, uh, the, the state police is, a, is his, historically, uh, and still is, available to assist local departments. The problem is their headcount is down so much that they're not able to do it in the ways they used to. Um, but they, they have been here in Burlington because there is so much violence. And so it feels like there's a shooting a day in Burlington. I know there's not. I know it's not that frequent. But we're hearing about them all the time. And the state police is supporting where they can. But they are stretched very, very thinly. And the Attorney General's office can uh, prosecute any case in, in Burlington or any, uh, in Chittenden County or any other county. And I think it's a good idea for the Attorney General to look at um, adding into the triage uh, violent crime, gun crime, and uh, drug trafficking. My take on that is that Vermont is very unique in the sense that, uh, first of all, the state police uh, was created 75 years ago in the state of Vermont uh, based upon a failure of the Bennington County Sheriff's Department being able to deal with the Paula Weldon case that where a Bennington College student went missing. And uh, that sparked uh, an outcry for a better organized law enforcement uh, team from the state, for the state of Vermont. And that was instrumental in the creation of the Vermont State Police. But that being said, one of the things that is that model I don't think is feasible or even plausible to be thought of in the state of Vermont because we have over 240 towns in Vermont and almost every one of these towns operates independently, has its own school board, select board, 
we're not a state where you have county government or some other mechanism where you have a larger cohesive group of towns that are governed by a larger body. In Vermont, it's either local, local, or state level. And as far as the policing goes, you know, everybody talks about community policing and how the police need to get back to basics. Well, I can tell you that most municipal and city police have been doing community policing since their, since their creation. And not anything in contrast to the state police, but there's something to be said about having a law enforcement presence where the people that work for that law enforcement agency live in their communities, their kids go to school in those communities, and they have a communal connection to the community. And that's why in places like New York City and some of the areas have problems because you're bringing in law enforcement officers from outside of the area to provide law enforcement services in an area where they don't live. And they tend, you tend to do things differently when you work under that kind of environment. And I'm not suggesting that the officers do anything wrong, but it does take on a different uh, flavor, so to speak, if you are actually living and, and uh, running into these people that you're policing every day. So, you know, I don't think that that's going to solve the problem with that. And number two is, it doesn't make any difference whether it's the state police or Burlington PD. We have a recruitment issue. So you're not going to be able to find these guys to fill these positions to begin with. And, you know, you may be able to dress things up by way of salary, benefits, and that kind of package. But I can tell you, as somebody who's spent my, adult, my entire adult life doing this business, the vast majority of these people doing police work don't do it for the money. They do it because they feel like they're adding something to their communities. And when I say that, uh, you know, I, I would just put this out there to the general public and you can take this however you want. Imagine waking up every morning, whether you work in the grocery store, Vermont Teddy Bear Factory or, or any other place for that matter. And you woke up every morning knowing that the people that you work for, or at least that are elected to represent the people that you work for, don't appreciate you, want to defund you, and want to look at any opportunity they can to take your livelihood away from you. Not much of an incentive to go there with a good attitude. Yeah. And, you know, I think until we turn this attitude towards law enforcement around and... Uh, you know, I'm not saying we should be kissing up or sucking up to the police, but stop demonizing the profession based upon a few bad apples. You know, I've said time and time again, the people that are defunding the police and wanting to do this and wanting to go after the police, they're doing the very same thing that they're accusing the police of. They're taking one or two bad examples of a police officer doing something, whether it be the George Floyd incident or the Trevon Martin incident or any other incident around the country, and you're trying to hold police officers here in Burlington that have never done anything wrong, that have come to work day after day, year after year, and done a good job for you, and you're demonizing them for something somebody else did, and that's not fair. Yep. And until that attitude changes, you're not going to get the kind of people you want. Yes. What I just heard him say was elections matter. Hi. I, I live in uh, central Vermont, um, out in a rural area, and I wanted to let the folks in Burlington know you are not alone when it comes to troubles with police protection. Where I live, we are a good half hour from three state police barracks, and a little over half an hour away from the sheriff's office in Orange County. And uh, we cannot rely on any police protection. Matter of fact, the gallows humor in where I live is that uh, if you need to call the police, remind them to bring along the uh, uh, 
the yellow tape and the body bags because by the time they get there, this, that's the only help they're going to be for us. Um, so, you know, now we're all fairly well armed ourselves, and we're probably the poster child for Second Amendment in the town that I live, and I'm not identifying what town that is. Um, anyway, so I, that was just a statement. My question is about um, heroin addiction and the, if there has been developed any cure. When I had my businesses in Philadelphia, I had several folks that had heroin issues that were being resolved with methadone. And one older fellow always came to mind, and I always felt so sad. Um, he would come to work, and he could only work for a few hours because then he had to go away to wherever he got his treatment and then come back. And it was obvious that at some point in the past, he was a really you know, good person, a very intelligent person. But uh, uh, his heroin use had reduced him to a mere husk of a person. And he would come in, and he was very, very punctual. He was very, very you know, interested in trying to do the modest job that he had but he had no capacity. Every day he would arrive and ask the same questions. Hi, I'm here, what do you want me to do first? And, and his job was very menial and very routine. And it just broke my heart. Uh, and he, there was no cure at that time. That he, he just went and got his methadone uh, 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 treatment and that was all that his life was ever going to be. Has that improved at all since, uh, this is probably 15 years ago? Hi, Brooke. How are you? <laughs> well, we go way back, so. <laughs> um, I mean, you're sort of you're sort of known as well. <laughs> All right. Um, I will I will say this. I do think. Look, it, it's it. Uh, this is why I mentioned that if you're going to have medically assisted treatment, it needs to be under doctor supervision um, and it needs to be with wraparound services. Um, uh, it can't be just give a dose and hope for the best. Um, and I have seen, in my experience, I've seen improvement. I've seen, um, you know, peop I'll keep bringing up my friend who was a defendant of mine. He started out on buprenorphine. He, uh, he also had inpatient care. Um, and he's, he got to the point where he didn't need the medication anymore, but it took him, it took him some years, but he was working, um, he got married, he's, he's had a kid, um, and I just don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, but I agree with you, it needs to be uh, a comprehensive approach that looks at the whole person and doesn't just dose them and send them on their way. I, I, I personally... And I, this is this is a, a controversial topic. I personally am against uh, buprenorphine, Suboxone, any of that stuff. People have to get away from it. They have they have to be abstinent. If we replace one addiction with just a legal doctor prescribed addiction, you're still an addict. Uh, those medications are they mimic you being high. They, they create, it's not exactly the same, obviously, but that is the point, is to basically make it so that you don't get uh, withdrawals or cravings in the same way, and that doesn't fix you, that doesn't help you. I can tell you for me personally that it was developing a relationship with a God of my understanding that helped me get and stay sober, and it is the thing that helps me stay sober 13 years later today. Until you get right in your mind what it is that has you in so much devastation and despair that you just have to check out from the world, you're not going to get better. And one substance, I did that. I was, I, was a, I was a drug addict. And so I was like, oh, I'll just quit doing drugs and I'll just drink because that, that's not my problem. And it very quickly became my problem. And so everything that I did, even therapy and counseling and all of that stuff, nothing made a difference until I was willing to surrender my life and admit that I was powerless over my addiction. Step one, admit that I am powerless. Step two, become willing to believe in a power greater than yourself that can restore you to sanity. Three, become willing to make 
uh, to, to give your life over to that God. Four, make a searching and fearless moral inventory of yourself. Go make amends and apologize for everything that you've done wrong. One of the biggest problems in our system right now, because people are not being held accountable, is they never have to humble themselves and apologize for the things that they've done wrong. And you carry around that guilt and that shame everywhere you go and you can't let it go. And no medically assisted uh, whatever can take away that internal struggle. I don't know other than a relationship with a creator, that's me personally. Anything, if, you don't get, if you don't get God, if you don't get a therapist, if you don't get some way to figure it out why you're not dealing with life well, I don't know how you get better. That's my personal Did you opinion. have... <laughs> so... Question. Do we have time for one more question? We could take one more question. Okay. I'd like to just broach on three subjects real quick. Uh, I worked, Pretty not directly awesome. with Howard Center, but I worked with addicts that were going there. I worked Jim, with, uh, bring, the, bring the microphone really close. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to let everybody know that I have worked, I have worked with addicts that go to the Howard Center. And I will tell you, it's a Band-Aid. Howard Center is cashing in. I lost two people in two years, people who wanted to get better. One of them was very close to me. They hurt, because I'm a caregiver. I will tell you that Howard Center, just like Erica just said, they are keeping people addicted. I have seen it. They get $170 per dose for patient. They have 1,000 patients per day at San Remo, just one of the sites. $62 million a year gross the Howard Center and the state are making. And I know fathers and daughters. I know family members that don't get treatment. They get Band-Aid. And there's court orders saying if you screw up, if you go back to doing drugs, you're going back to jail. And counselors at Howard Center say, we're not going to tell anybody, but guess what? We're going to give you a half a dose today. So next time you come in, you better be straight. It's a Band-Aid. They're keeping people addicted, number one. Number two, Mike Hall and Erica, where were you guys in July 2021? Remember, remember Montpelier? Okay. I don't want to hear about how good Phil Scott is doing for the state. Because the, what happened that day, Mike? What happened? What were they there for and what happened that day? We, we had a law enforcement rally. I organized a rally to support law enforcement. Yeah. First time I met Erica. I asked Mike to come and speak. My father was a police officer. And like Mike was talking about with uh, Mr. Floyd, it's a terrible situation, but we didn't do it. But I'm sitting on the couch with my wife one day in May and I said, look, I'm sick of this. They're attacking every law enforcement in America saying they're killing black people. It's all a lie. So we're gonna have a law enforcement rally to support good people. We had good stories. We had heroic stories. We had a woman who was saved by an officer. She was being raped. She ran out of her door and into the arms of an officer. And she got up and spoke. And you know what happened? BLM bust up people from Massachusetts and Connecticut. An hour into a three hour event, they took over our event, physically and verbally assaulting people. With the Capitol Police, the Montpelier Police and the State Police watching. And I had worked for weeks because I was receiving email threats if I had this rally, they were coming. And I will tell you flat out, Chief Pete is a good friend of mine from Montpelier. Chief Pete was just starting in Montpelier and the city council told him, do not get involved, do not do anything. We don't want your first experience in Montpelier to be supporting law enforcement and protecting these people. BLM has to have their voice. That's how that started. Phil Scott saw a video the day after it happened, and you know what he said? We can never have a rally like this on the State House lawn again. Because I was the biggest racist in the state because I wasn't sympathetic to George Floyd. My father was a cop, and he was a good cop. And I knew bad cops, and guess what? They took care of each other. There's a bad cop, they took him out. I'm not talking to kill somebody. They said, you're gone. We don't want you here. Yes, I do have a question. I'm sorry. Actually, not a question, I have a statement. Erica, 
mentioned a little while ago. Is anybody going to run for state attorney in Chittenden County? I'm going to run for Chittenden County state attorney. I'm going to defeat Sarah George in a writing campaign. It's going to be a lot about coming out. We're going to be doing some videos. We're going to be doing a lot of meetings around people, around Chittenden County. And I'm going to take out Sarah George because Sarah George isn't looking out for you. And she didn't look out for my wife. December 2019, my wife was struck by a drunk driver while she was snow blowing in our yard. At 4 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, the guy's third offense hit and run, 0.26. Sarah George gave him less than two days in jail. No question. I apologize if I'm uh, out of place. I just want you to know that somebody cares, and I'm standing up. Thank you. This was the first of a, in a series of three uh, events that Keep Vermont Safe will be hosting on public safety. We, I personally thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us this evening. Keep Vermont Safe. I'd like to thank the, my team with Keep Vermont Safe. You guys were all fantastic. This was a, a lot of work that, and a lot of time went into this, and we really appreciate, I truly appreciate all the help that you put in. Uh, Burlington City Arts for allowing us the use of this space, for our law enforcement personnel that showed up today to make sure that we were safe, and to all of our guests in the audience tonight, thank you for coming. Uh, please uh, follow Keep Vermont Safe online, and. Uh, be on the lookout for one of our next upcoming events, and you can always reach out to any one of us if you have any questions. We're happy to connect you with whatever we can. Thank you again. Feel free to stay, hang out, mingle. Remember that this has been live streamed. It's available on keepvermontsafe.com and generally irritable on YouTube. Share it, share it with all your friends and family. Let's keep the message out there.